yourself oh, to, and unmute the mirror. Ask to unmute, and then I think you might have to unmute yourself, Mr. There you go. Okay. I'm unmuted. You are unmuted, but geez, some people aren't going to like to hear that. Brother, um, how are you, first of all? I'm good. It was, a, it was a busy day, Jim. We had uh, 15 ribbon cuttings in our din downtown today. So it was busy. Yesterday, we had uh, the premier here for uh, most of the day, along with a couple of his ministers, Minister of Finance, Minister of Tourism. So it was, uh, it was a long day. It's been some long days lately. I saw that post about the 15 businesses. Was it a Chamber of Commerce post? What, what were you guys kneeling in the street for? Um, oh, we were just at a po We just posed for a picture. Oh. It was the downtown uh, BIA, the business improvement area. And, uh, you know, I think their point was that even during COVID, businesses are opening and uh, they know that it's not the greatest time to open, but they're opening. They expect the, the good news to be on the way that, uh, that you know, things are going to get better. And certainly they got to get better uh, because it's been a tough year for everybody and for businesses and businesses in our downtown. So it's kind of funny. It's done a full... Uh, full circle 360. I mean, downtown was hopping back in the day in the 60s and 70s. And then malls came along and that killed downtowns. And then big box stores came and hurt malls and in some cases became part of malls. And then uh, uh, e-commerce came around and that shifted things again. And here we are again, people want the anti-franchise authentic experience of uh, eclectic, unique downtown with interesting offerings. So uh, anyway, it was very interesting, all the different things opening. And of course, one of the new things now is cannabis. It's become uh, a new part of retail areas. And that was one of the things we opened up three or four of those uh, shops today too. We cut ribbons there. Yeah, Queen Street. Tell me, has the pandemic or any lockdown measures because of it personally impacted you? Some people think, and maybe rightly so, you know, the higher up you get, the less prone you are. You know, I know, you know, politicians aren't skipping checks, that type of thing. But as far as mental capacity, your kids, like, have you seen any personal impact on on your mental state or your your physical health or anything? like? How are you, how you making out with it? Yeah, I mean, so physical health, I, I make sure for me, uh, exercise is my drug. You know, so I work out, I've got some stuff at home, I walk a lot, I, uh, I stay very physical, very active, but yeah, I've got three teenagers, you know, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm very well aware, and I feel bad, my son started high school this year, and of course, he's never had a real high school experience, I've got one of my daughters is in university, and, you know, she's mostly learning from home, it's, it's just not the authentic experience, and then I've got another daughter in between. So it's, uh, it's been a challenging time. I mean, we have not had a family gathering at my parents' house in over a year. It was last Easter that we canceled our first family gathering. So uh, it's mentally had an impact on a lot of us. And here is uh, City Hall, we're, we're deemed essential. So we have to work and, uh, and we need to work and we should work. And it's, it's hard to hear people uh, until you've had somebody crying on the phone because they're about to lose their house uh, because they're in a bad situation. Their mental health has just gone off the charts. Uh, we, I, I've heard some really, really sad stories. So for sure, our physical health is important, but you cannot isolate your mental health and your financial health. It all ties together. It's all part of the big picture. And people suffer in different ways. Some people are outward, some people are more inward, but we all hurt. And, uh, you know, I, I try to focus. I'm a silver lining kind of guy and I'll find the silver lining in any gray cloud. And, and there's lessons to be learned. Uh, there's Easter eggs everywhere in everything in life that we do. So, I mean, I think that's part of the experience of life. And, and you know, you and I, the last time we talked was uh, after I'd finished my uh, cancer challenges. And, and even that, I, I don't ever think of that as a curse. I think of it as a blessing because it helped me to really appreciate what matters in life. And sometimes, unfortunately, you need to lose things to really appreciate them. But uh, as long as there's a lesson at the end of it, it's worth it. So uh, it's been it's been definitely challenging and in elected office, extra challenging because, you know, people are angry, they're anxious, they're stressed, they're frustrated, they're depressed. There are all these terrible feelings and they lash out. And who do they lash out on? Well, oftentimes it's the one that's right in front of them. 
And those of us in elected office, and, and we spoke with the premier about this yesterday and some of his ministers, and we've all dealt with it. It's, it's been a very, very difficult year for all of us. And, uh, but we need to understand when someone attacks, oftentimes you got to see where they're coming from to really understand why they're doing it. They're, uh, they're maybe feeling some pain and that's how they're dealing with it. So anyway, we, uh, this is what we've been elected to do. Nobody said it was going to be easy. Certainly hasn't been as easy as it could be, but I mean, hey, it's a pandemic. So uh, there's no pandemic for dummies. There's no manual on how to run through COVID. So it's one of these things that you hope you've accumulated enough skills and tools along the way of life that you can use some of them for this. Even if you have to MacGyver a few of them, that's kind of that's kind of where we where we've been at right now. Well, tell me, is there, what's been hardest about this for you politically? or uh, otherwise, as far as, you know, some of the decisions you've had to make where, you know, you, you know, there's going to be an impact, there's going to be a, a cost, there's going to be unintended consequences. I mean, I, as a critic, I point to a lot of the lockdown measures have not, have not, they're not based in science from all I can tell, even the, the UN is saying they don't work. You know, I've got my questions about the effectiveness of masks. And now a year later, we're seeing that, you know, side by side communities, masks, one masked and one uh, unmasked really doesn't make a difference. So have you tr have you been troubled by any of the decisions you've had to take, especially when it comes to restrictions on on commerce? Yeah, it, there's been a lot of decisions. And obviously, you make the best decision with the information you have at the time. And that doesn't mean that information is static and it doesn't mean that you're not going to change your opinion. I mean, a classic example is masks. I mean, so we all understand we, we have our masks, you know, and I've got my, I've got my masks and I've got lots of masks all over the place and theme masks and, and it's quite a, a, a business, but you know, in the very beginning, public health was telling us not to wear masks because they were worse because uh, improperly worn masks uh, is probably a bad thing. You know, uh, oftentimes viruses and whatnot will go through your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And that's why when you're a kid, your parents always told you, wash your hands. And uh, when you're adjusting a mask constantly, and I see some people constantly adjusting the mask, putting their hand near their face. And so I get that. In the beginning, public health was against it. And then they shifted. And then they were for it. And throughout time, I mean, you can look at Copernicus, you could look at all the different people, you know, at one time, we thought that the sun revolved around the earth. And uh, it was widely believed. And uh, if you went against that, you were ridiculed. And Copernicus had to go against the church, he ended up being uh, imprisoned. And I mean, here we are today, too. I mean, we're, a lot of people have different views on the right thing to do. And I don't think it's so you ask me, it's the hardest thing. The hardest thing is knowing that we're not all going to agree on anything. We can all look at the same thing and have a different view of it. And I think that that's, I think understanding that's tolerance, understanding that we're not all going to feel the same way and being respectful of where other people are coming from. And that's hard during this time because people are feeling a lot of stress when they haven't had a hug. They haven't seen their loved ones. They have maybe haven't gone to work. Maybe they've lost their business. Maybe they don't know if they're going to have a job when this is all done. Maybe everybody's in their house because their kids aren't going to a physical school. Um, maybe people are having money problems trying to decide to, whether I buy food or do I pay the hydro bill. So it's definitely put stress and I can feel it. And, uh, and it's hard because uh, I can't anymore just say this is the case. It's this is the way it looks for me. And then someone else has a different view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, talk to us a, a little bit about the climate, um, both well, political at City Hall and at the region. You've got two different entities there. They both have their own characters, uh, flaws and, and, and pros, I guess. But uh, talk to me about how you see, I mean, so much polarization these days. Everyone seems to be an expert on everything uh, to the point where they're, you know, ending friendships because, I don't know, you voted a certain way or you, you had a take on masks or something like that. But talk to us about the political climate and how that may have changed over. I mean, you've been watching politics for a long time, whether you're elected or not. Uh, how do you see that, uh, you know, logistically playing out? Well, I think the, the word that you said was key is polarizing. And sometimes that's frustrating. And, um, and this is one of the things I was one of the 
one of the uh, number of messages that I'm hoping to bring out today, you know, with, uh, with your interview is polarizing. And, and sometimes it's the worst thing because people end up going farther apart in their beliefs. And, and, and my thinking has always been, I try to meet someone in the middle. I try to focus on the common ground. And oftentimes, you know, people focus on our differences and I like to focus on where we're sharing things and then meet you in the middle. And then we can have a discussion and then go from there. Because I think most people have more things in common than they have difference. And, but, but it's just, it depends on what you focus on. And a lot of people like conflict. No, I shouldn't say a lot of, some people like conflict. Some people like to focus on the differences and polarizing is not ever healthy. You know, I remember once before I, I made a comment about something and uh, it was a comment that I guess was popular with one party, one elected party. And they said, well, you can't say that. That idea comes from this party. And I said, a good idea is a good idea wherever it comes from. And, and really, that's where I'm coming from. I try to meet people in the middle and I try to focus on what we have in common. And then I try to build from there. Because if we're always going to be fighting and focusing on our differences, we're never going to come together. We're never going to agree on anything. And even if we agree to disagree, at least it's a start. But polarizing is not a healthy thing. And yeah, at the region, the pendulum swings. It swings this way, then it swings that way. But then it swings back again and back again. There's always corrections and it's always moving. So I get along with everybody. I really genuinely like everybody. And I try to focus on, on the things that we have in common and go from there. We can disagree on a lot of things. And I can go out and have lunch with somebody who doesn't like eating meat. And that's okay. I'm okay where they are, as long as they're not going to criticize what I'm going to eat. And, and that's kind of my approach to things. Cool. Uh, in relation to the Bilsma case, I mean, I, I really enjoyed hearing that you stood up and said, you know, I'm not going to support this amendment. Um, I haven't been paying attention all that much to local politics. I just... I gave up on it, I guess. I, I think that's kind of sad because that's where the rubber really meets the road as far as uh, the most important things to you. But in this last integrity complaint against Bilsma, uh, you warned against the goose pile. And then um, regional, councilor, uh, regional council went over and above the recommendations of the actual integrity commissioner, which I thought was strange. Um, what do you see the process being like? Is it political? I mean, now we've got counselors, you know, or uh, yeah, counselors, I guess, you know, filing integrity complaints against each other um, because they don't like something like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm with Bilsma. All lives matter. I don't find that offensive at all. That includes black people. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not into the ideology of black lives matter. I don't want to, you know, drag that thing out, but I didn't find what he said all that offensive yet. And it's right in the code. Like, uh, I copied this down today. Members of council shall not impose their personal, moral, or religious standards on others, as every person is an individual's specific rights, values, beliefs, personalities, traits to be respected at all times. Do you think we need a code that's succinct across the province and one that respects the charter so we don't get into this kind of stuff anymore. You know, I've been saying this for a long time. I didn't know that the codes didn't match up across the province. And it makes sense that they're charter tested. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I like to see uh, uniformity and, and that we're all dealing with the same thing. So whatever city you're in, uh, wherever you live, wherever you're elected, we've got a very similar set of rules. And each one may be interpreted differently by an integrity commissioner. And I think it depends on the goal because the goal should be to get to the truth. That's all. Uh, and some people abuse it because their goal is to hurt somebody. And I think that's really unfortunate that that is being used for something like that, but that's how it is in life, right? I mean, things can be used for good or things can be used for not good. So I do like the idea that it would be consistent. I think it's a, it's a really good idea. And, and regarding uh, Bilsma, I mean, I participated in the Justice for Black Lives March last summer. And, uh, and I felt good about it. I mean, I was at the Rainbow Crosswalk that we did uh, at City Hall. Um, I'm, I'm all for defending 
uh, people's choices in life and, and not criticizing and not putting my own views on them. And, and that's why once the integrity commissioner made their decision, I thought that was it. That was the end of it. And some people, and again, I don't want to criticize anybody because that's not my goal. Uh, but everyone's entitled to wherever they come from and uh, they make their own decisions and they need to fall, fall asleep at night and sleep well. And, and I just felt that he received his punishment, uh, you know, and, uh, and he's a good, he's a good person. He's got strong religious beliefs and I'm okay with that. And because it's different than others, that's fine too. You know, but what I often, you know, ask people is say, you know, maybe you can at least apologize for anyone you offended. And that doesn't mean you have to apologize for your religious beliefs. You shouldn't have to uh, apologize for that. But it's okay to say, listen, I'm sorry if you were offended. You're not changing who you are or what you believe or where you're coming from. You're just saying something like that. And some people are easily offended. Others are not. And, and to me, again, it's, it, it, stands with, it starts with being humble and humbling yourself. And it takes a big person it takes a really big person to apologize or to acknowledge maybe you hurt somebody. It might not have been intentional. It might have been unintentional. Maybe you thought you were being honest with somebody, but you were too honest with them and it really hurt them. Maybe you caught them at a bad moment. So, you know, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm wimping out, Jim, but I really believe there's enough conflict in this world and people are fighting all over the world, killing each other. And, and, and even locally here, we're going after each other. And why? Because you come from the right, you come from the left. So therefore we won't get along. And I, and I just think it's just, it's just really unfortunate because we focus on our differences. And, and I mean, you think about it, even sports. Oh, you're a Habs fan. Well, I'm a Leafs fan. So we can't get along, you know, and, and you, the, the, it goes everywhere. It doesn't matter. You went to this high school. I went to this high school. We're, we're rivals. Uh, you're from this city. I'm from that city. You know, our city's better. And, and I guess that competition has been bred into us and we always want to do better and be better. But I, I think one thing I've learned throughout life, and I'm, I'm a pretty competitive person, I really um, like to respect the other person. Yeah, I want to win, but I like to start by respecting the other person. And I think maybe we could use a little more respect for everyone's opinions and not chastising right away and jumping on and goose piling. And because and, you know that saying, when you point your finger, there's three pointing back. And that's, that's what I say to everyone. I said, just remember that because unless you're perfect, uh, you know, we all live in glass houses. We are all imperfect every single one of us. Amen. So, uh, so, so forget the arrogance and uh, just acknowledge that and be humble. I don't know. I got a lot of respect for someone who's, who's humble. And when you're these great athletes or these great business people or great politicians or great, whatever. And when they're humble, I think that is just the most, one of the most endearing qualities when, when they can be like the rest of us, because we all put our clothes on the same way. We all bleed the same way. We're all going to die the same way. Uh, you know, nobody lives forever. And uh, I think it's nice that we could humble and acknowledge that. It would be great to get back to, there is no racism because there's only one race. Like I'm racist, the human race, you know, it's a, you know, and Jim, this is the second time you've made this point. And I think it's worth uh, expanding on, and I've made it several times in my own podcast here. The 95%, 98% of us actually are in the, in the moderate middle of the bell curve with the fat part. We all share mostly the same beliefs and ideas of how we want the country run, how we, you know, liberals and conservatives alike. We're in that that fat majority middle, sometimes a silent majority. And then the wing nuts on the left and the right on the extreme ends are so small, but they're so loud now. I think we forget, we get programmed and we're like, we're not like this. Like the, you know, Steven Crowder does this. If you've got two people that are apart on an argument, you can back them up to a point where they agree somewhere. Like, I think that's a, that's a valuable skill to have is say, you know what? I, I hate the the idea that saying that we're all in together this together because I think the, the pandemic wise, we have not been all in this together. I mean, there's some people that are really, really hurting. On the on the other hand, some people, you know, the life hasn't changed too much. But you make a great point when you say, you know, we all want the same thing. We're all we all bleed red. We forget that even ideologically and politically, we can I'll look at how many times people vote conservative and liberal. They go back and forth. It's just an example of being in the moderate middle and not married to an ideology. Uh, ideology. Oftentimes, people vote for the leader 
uh, not the party because they just like what they represent or they, they just like the way they present themselves. And, uh, and I, I'm going to tell you, I, I don't believe I'm all of anything. And I find we like to label people. We like to put them in their, in their lane and say, you're a this and you're a that. And I'm not big on labels. And, and that's why things like, you know, any kind of label or name calling, I don't like, uh, you know, people have said, well, you're a this, like pick a party. And I say, why do I have to be one or the other? Why do I have to like chocolate or vanilla, but not both? And it depends what mood I'm in. There's things I like better about vanilla. Some days, and I and I love chocolate, don't get me wrong. I like some days I feel like strawberries. Some days I want a shamrock shake. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, we just condition people that if you're a this, if I label you this, then this is what you will do. This is what you will like. And I think that's part of part of the challenge. I think it's okay to not just be this. You could be other things. And I don't know. I, I think as I get older, I get, I'll use the word wiser. I use that sparingly, but the more experiences that I've had in life, I start to see things different. And I do, I'm a very different person today than I was yesterday. Very different. All the different things in my life have shaped me. And some of the beliefs I held when I was younger, I completely don't now. And I, and I really respected what I read about you, you know, cause you made some, you made some comment too, that you don't believe you don't believe in all the things that you used to believe. And, and, and I feel the same way because we're evolving, we're growing, we're developing. I, I like to think we're trying to become better. I, I like to think that, you know, and, uh, and I like to encourage people to do that. You know, one of my mentors, and I've got a lot of great mentors, used to say praise progress. So when so somebody does something right, catch them doing it right instead of always hammering them when they do something wrong. And just like when you, when you train a dog, you know, you try to do it with a treat rather than, you know, the carrot and the stick approach. And, and again, again, we can agree to disagree. Somebody might like the stick approach. It's not my approach, but I can tell you that I would rather meet someone in the middle and then acknowledge what they did. And then, and, and hopefully encourage them to go in a certain, sometimes if you can just move them one degree or two degrees, their trajectory will take them in a totally different in a to totally different direction, because I know my personal development and evolution has been a gradual thing. And if somebody had hammered me over the head with a certain idea, I would have totally polarized and went the other way. So I try with my kids, and this is where I've learned the exercise and patience with my kids, because, you know, kids, it seems to be bred into them that they don't want to listen to their parents. And if you tell them do this, they will do the opposite. So I try to suggest things and ask them questions and and encourage them. And, and it doesn't mean they're going to listen and do the right thing. And sometimes they frustrate me and I'm sure I frustrate them too. But I, it's just kind of a, a, a process, a soft sell, if you will. And uh, I don't know, it seems it's an approach that I prefer to do. Yeah, I appreciate your take on apologies too. Um, I, I will say though, that when I apologize, you know, it's very personal, you know, and it's, I want, I want to think it's meaningful. Like I put some time into it. One, here's the inauthentic way of being for me. Here's two, the impact it caused. And you really have to put some thought into, I've been this way and it caused this as an impact. I get the impact on you, on your children and the rest of the world as the ripples go out. If you spend a good amount of time on the impact and you really care about the person you're talking to, it should break you, right? Then three is always, uh, you know, inventing a new way of being that kind of counteracts that old way of being and then count, asking for accountability. I mean, this is all formatted because you're often going to, we're machines. We go back to our old ways of being all the time. And, you know, if you promised your kid, I'm going to be more fun and he catches you being too serious and says, dad, Hey, what about fun? You go, ah, yeah, you go back because they can catch you in the middle of it. So, I don't have any problem getting right with my with the people I care about. I do have a problem apologizing to the mob. Like if I've offended it, like the statement, if I've offended anyone, I'm sorry, means absolutely nothing to me. It's worse, worse than useless. So uh, I wonder what your thoughts are and, you know, getting getting right because, you know, I'm not, you know, I have my moments and the, there have been public moments. Um and, you know, I said this to you on the phone, I can caution you a little bit about white knighting, like with Bob Cowan. Oh, I know he said some, some offside things and, you know, I'm going to go shine some light in the corner there to, you know, I, you know, how about, I have known Jimmy a long time. I know his family. 
He's done a lot of broadcasting, no scripts. There's no evidence of whatever you guys are saying about him. So I've done many shows with them and I expect to do more with them and you can expect them to be kind of like they were before. So anyways, I, I want your thoughts on apologies and coming correct because I have no problem getting right with people, but I will not apologize for someone that may have been offended by so. Hey, there's lots of people that aren't going to agree with what I believe, but that's not my job to make sure they don't get offended. So I don't know that it's anybody's job to do anything, but I think, I think apologizing, uh, it's a humbling experience and it's why some people don't like to do it. And I'm not saying you, but I know some people because there's some ego involved, you know, and, um, and, you know, I'd say I'm a, I'm a spiritual person more than religious, but uh, one of my mentors said to me a long time ago too, that ego stands for edging God out. And whether you, you're religious or spiritual or not, I just thought that hit me once right between right between the eyes. And I thought, wow. And I realized I you hadn't said that, Jim. <laughs> That's great. And what well, you know what I realized that the more humble that I am, the better life gets for me. And I really genuinely mean that. I mean, when somebody throws credit my way, well, when I was younger, oh, I couldn't get enough of it. It felt great. And I realized it was pumping up my ego. And you know, the old, the, the bigger they are, the farther and harder they fall. And I experienced that in life over and over again. And I, and I, I just couldn't understand it. And, and it's funny. So I've been lucky. I've had some great mentors and, and I've had some great challenges in life, all sorts, personally, physically. I, I've had it all. I mean, I've, and, you know, people that have had public challenges. I mean, I've had death threats. I've had like you, I, I've had, I've done a lot of things, you know, I worked for myself for a lot of time. I've had a lot of things happen and I wouldn't change any of it because it's who it's what made me who I am today. But I believe apologizing is the ultimate humble exercise. And, and I have no problem it doesn't, I don't lose anything. It's like a candle doesn't lose anything by lighting another candle. And by apologizing, you don't lose anything, but maybe you help somebody on their end because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what kind of childhood they had. And I'm not making excuses for people, but we don't know what the other person's been through. And sometimes they say, if you knew, you'd be begging to have your own problems back. And, and so I, you know what, and you know what I'd say, I'd say to that, Jim is, you know, cause I was criticized by you know, a lot of people for agreeing to come on your show. I'm going to be honest with you. I had some that were supportive and said, it's the right thing to do. And I had some people that said, it's the wrong thing to do. You're just going to draw more attention, you know, to somebody that's not tolerant, who's saying things that aren't nice. And I, I always, and I, first of all, I, I know you to be a good person and capable of good things. I know that. And, and I, and I, your dad, when I had my bakery distribution company, I used to sell products to your dad and he was another super guy. I know a couple of times I dropped things off at his house uh, in Niagara Falls and uh, was a real gentleman. And, uh, and you're a natural on-air personality. You're very talented uh, when you're on the radio station, uh, when you're doing your, your show now, your podcast, you're, you're talented. And I always say, use your talents for good, for moving the ball forward, for helping society, humanity. You know, and I know you got to get attention and I know you got to get noticed and what's going to get you out there. And, and, and fair enough. But I guess I guess I would kind of ask you this. Would you... And I know what you just said a second ago, and it's not your job, but would you consider apologizing to people that were hurt or offended? No, not, not, not the mob. I've made several calls to Lori yep, because she was a friend of mine. We were tight, man. Like I, uh, people know this, but because I've taught, I've spoken about it only because of the attention that was brought on because I use colorful language. I mean, seriously, she says JFC, I say DFC, which one's worse? Like for me, I don't like those, like I say the other stuff all the time, but I don't use the Lord's name in vain. It just curdles my skin. So I called Laura yep, three times. I left messages. I'd like to apologize. Well, before my last episode went out, I called her before seven o'clock before it went out just to say, you know, and, and you know, I don't mind bearing the hatchet. You know, I have no problem saying, ah, you know, you know what? I'm sorry. I was a jackass. Um, but no, it's still up there. I mean, it, I put this video up when, when, when I was making the transition from YouTube to BitChute. So I didn't transfer it over. I didn't put it on iTunes because 
I wasn't all that proud of it, you know, but in, in context, that's a snapshot of my frustration in time at a, at a very, yeah, I said some things, but the fact that the reaction is, is that I'm an irredeemable human being. There's nothing, there's no path for me forward. And, you know, I've had people saying, you know, one day someone like a counselor yet may look and go, oh, geez, I've become the bully that I, I uh, that I hate. Because I've never, I, hey, I had a Twitter mob. I could have said, get them. I, I've never done that. But I was, you know, and then I want to ask you about this. I don't want to make it about me, but I'm interested in about the media treatment because, you know, I used to have some friends in media. I used to get some fair coverage. Now I'm spreading misinformation because, and, and you know, unlike uh, similarly to the Trump supporters that said, oh, he's the reason that everyone's dead in the States because of coronavirus, they can't point to anything they would have done differently. Point to one thing that's that I've been intolerant or racist or trans or uh, homophobic. It's just not out there. And anyone knows me the same. The girls that I've been with, you know, some of them like, it's just, it's, it's just not there. So would I consider apologizing to the mob? No, I don't think I would. And I won't, but if, and I don't think I need to apologize for, to, to say to Jim Diodati, Hey, dummy don't vote for that mask extension what are you killing me <laughs> yeah i mean you, you don't think any less of me because i use language with you um but then if i get personal or i you know an offhand remark or i say something inappropriate i'm concerned how it lands on you i'm concerned about the impact of our relationship together and Lori yip's no different i don't put her in any different class so one-on-one -on -one, i have no problem saying hey what the hell we're friends for six years but you know what? I've lost a lot of friends since I've, well, I call it wisdom. I've matured as I've gotten older. I've gone towards the center. Now I lean right because the left doesn't stand for free speech. I don't think more gun laws are making safer communities. I don't think that there's a, uh, a, there's no stats that can show you that black men are being hunted by white cops in the States. And, and then this is another thing I'd like to get into these false narratives. I mean, so many people are quick to fall in line. The FBI see stats for the last year say that twice the number of unarmed white men were killed by cops. Yeah, yeah, there's racism. Yeah, it exists. But this false narrative and Justin Trudeau every day almost that he takes the podium tells us he's trying to make us believe that Canada, every institution in Canada is systemically racist. That means the whole thing, Jim. It doesn't, it doesn't mean isolated events, an isolated judge here and there, you know, too long of a conviction or sentence or something here. It means like all of us, the whole country, the whole police force, the whole RCMP. And I just like, geez, we've, we've come a long way, Jim. And I'm not willing to abandon celebrating that we're more tolerant than we ever have been. In, in, in fact, more loving, more tolerant, more considerate. And we got people screaming from the rooftops, racism, gender pay gap. Like, I just, I really, I've, I really, I'm frustrated by it, man. And, uh, you know, as I've said on an earlier podcast, it's like we've uh, thrown a blanket of pain on everyone. Here's a nice, heavy blanket of pain. React. And some people react differently. So, uh, you know, I'm not immune to it. Uh, the guys in my men's group do a great job of going, Jimmy, you're not special. Like you really, your problems are not unique to anyone here. We all have them. We're men, you know? So anyways, you asked the question of would I, would I apologize to the mob? No, I'm, I won't, but I'll apologize to you if I feel I owe you one. And it'd be a meaningful conversation, Jim, and very deliberate. Here's the way I was. Here's the impact. I don't want that. Here's where I'm going to be moving forward and I need your help. So. I don't know if that straightens anything out. But well, you know, I, I want to turn this into a Jim Fannin show. I no. can do it any time by myself, so I'm talking too much. Well, I, I, I think uh, I, I, I'm glad that you're at least you're addressing it, and the fact that you tried to reach out to a counselor. Yep, and and you know, uh, well, it's okay to disagree with people. I just think it's not okay to disrespect. And you know, we're trying to get more women encouraged to come into politics and and things like that. I'm told, and again, I'm not a woman, and and I wouldn't try to guess what it's like to be a woman. But I, I, I'm sure that things like that would discourage him because I know people said to me, I, men or women, I would not get into politics. I see what people say to you and say about you online. Uh, I don't have thick enough skin. My feelings would be hurt. My family would be embarrassed. 
I got a mom and a dad too. coming at you because you're a man, though. I mean, this is not sex gender based. This is politics. You get criticized. You run for politics. You put your name. You stand up in regional council and say we're all racist by the by virtue of even the anti-racist people like me are racist because we grew up in a racist system. Ah, uh, no, no. It's not true. I won't believe it. Jim D. Dottie's not a racist because he grew up in Canada in virtually a white community in Niagara. You're not a racist because of that. Racism means I'm better than you because of my skin color. He, you know, there's just no one going around. There's so many, Jim, so many few people going around saying that. I don't know. Sorry. I still got you, Jim. Well, you know, here's I'm going to interpret. I think racist, and again, I don't like labels, and racist is another label, and it's a paint everything beige kind of thing. And But here's what I think people are trying to say is we're focusing on our differences. And, and I'll give another example of how some things we deny, but later maybe it comes out. Did you read in the paper uh, or you heard in the radio the uh, referee, the NHL referee no. uh, was caught, um, making comments against, I think it was Nashville. That he wanted to give him a ticket, or he wanted to give him a, a, a penalty. Why? And and here it's been years and years. They've been saying that all oh, the the refs, the the umpires, the whatever. And here he was caught. And the, but does that mean all refs are like that? You know, I don't know. But but it's interesting too because I used to be an umpire when I was a kid, and you make some bad calls. You do your best, but sometimes you make a bad call. So a natural thing. Some refs and umpires try to it out to keep it fair so maybe you called a strike that was uh, probably a ball turn it around right gotta get you try back. to balance oh, yeah. it out <laughs> right so and and we know what happens uh because people are trying to find that you know equity that 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 fair that fair part and i think what people oftentimes mean is where we focus on our differences whether it be gender whether it be color race pick your thing because is a, it's a country of immigrants, by and large, uh, uh, aside from the indigenous people here. Most people came here on a boat or a plane or something like that. Both my grandfathers, uh, you know, fought in World War One. They're both prisoners of war, you know, uh, one in uh, uh, both of them in Europe and, and the stories. But I mean, so we come here and I hear the stories of how my uncles were in fights all the time because people didn't like there are, are a certain uh, ethnic group. And, and, you know, and each new group, because they're the new group, they get the one that they get the short end of the stick and people are saying not nice things. And I, I, I don't know, I, I think it's part of, we're competitive. We focus on what our differences are. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I really try to focus on what I have in common with people. And I really love everybody. I really do. Even people who I don't like, I try to love them. I really try. And I know that sounds totally over the top, very Gandhi-ish and very, but I, I really respect a lot of things that were said by people like Martin Luther King, you know, people that he faced his oppressors. He went back and he met them in their place. And, and that's the only way that you're going to make change. You know, like, as he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate is the exact same way. So, Oftentimes we try to extinguish hate with hate. And, and I know you're the subject of that too, Jim. You said some things. So people said some not nice things uh, to you. And about you. I'm just and, calling names, but they, it, yeah, they literally come back and go, well, you you have, there's no, like you have no function on this planet after that. No. Like, you know what? We really need a path of redemption because when people come to realize that their ways aren't working for them, we need, we need, them to have a path back you know we, but the left just seems to want to exile the the people that don't agree with them and shut them up you know because they're done you know he believes you know uh you shouldn't abort a child after six months well that's what you know that's invasion of my blah 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 so anyways i don't, I don't want to get too far down that road but uh, one thing i know you did you were, that, yes, if so, i could go uh, ahead. What with the kids my i learned so much from my kids and from trying to teach them and raise them. And now, and I really appreciate my parents so much more. And I realize what a pain in the ass I was to them on so many things. And how when they told me to do things, I didn't always listen. And I realize now, now my parents, I think they're like some of the smartest people in the world. And, and my kids, 
So when I try, and I see it's the exact same thing. I'm like, how do I get through? Because they're teenagers, they know everything and it's hard to get through. And so one of the things I tell them, I try to just teach them the fundamentals in life. And then if you've got the right tool, you got a hammer, you got a saw, you got a, you know, a few tools you can do, you can MacGyver just about anything. But one of my, I always tell them is it's okay to make a mistake because failure is a part of success. It's not the opposite. And if anybody thinks that they haven't made failed a lot and they're going to do a lot more failure, they're, they're denying the truth. But I tell them failure, don't fear failure. It's okay. It's okay to make, but I said, but number one is learn your lesson and move on. Cause you, if you make the same mistake again, you're just being an idiot and life will keep hammering you down till you learn the lesson. Second thing I tell them is own it. Don't, if, if you did it, own it. I said, don't bury it because it doesn't bury. It doesn't go away. It's still there. Own it and then acknowledge it and apologize. And I'll tell you, there's some emancipating feeling. It just gets released and, and you let it go. And, and I tell my kids all the time, I go, I can handle bad news. I, I don't really, I don't want to handle lying. I don't like that. And I said, if you did something, it's okay. Just tell me, let's do, we can deal with that. I can deal with that a lot, a lot easier than I can with lying. And I like civil discourse, the idea of having a conversation, airing our different ideas. Mm -hmm. And we get a better understanding because how do you know what's going on in the other person's uh, mind? Side, man. Once you talk to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim, tell me what your understanding is. I've been, I've been hearing you throw the term equity around a lot. I don't like that term in relation to equality. I mean, I don't think men and women are equal. It doesn't mean I don't think we shouldn't have equal rights. Men are good at both, some things. Men, women generally are better at other things. Like, I don't know, giving birth. We're not equal. Like, women create life. It should be protected beyond you know, anything that a man could hope for. We don't, we don't need that type of protection, but you know, per, the equality of opportunity, right? I don't want equity in the outcomes. In other words, you know, we play a soccer game and everyone gets a trophy afterwards. No, some people, you gotta win. You gotta learn to lose as a child uh, uh, growing up. And, and equity is everyone's treated the same at the end of the game, even if one won, you know? So I wonder what your thoughts on, you know, I'm really, uh, I, I would like to focus on the equality of opportunity, but not the equity in the, in the sense that, oh, well, you both do the same job, but you, you know, even though this one performed better, we're going to raise this one up to so that they're equal pay, you know, your thoughts on equity. Well, I don't know that I use the word equity. And if I did, it was probably a mistake. I equality, diversity, inclusion, they're getting, can, can, um, they're getting, what's that word conflated lately because equity is a really popular term, but it actually doesn't mean equality of opportunity. It means we'll make the the outcomes equal afterwards, regardless of the performance. So, so I don't, yeah. And I don't agree with uh, participation trophies and not keeping score. I never agreed with that. When my kids were little because I said, it doesn't prepare you for life because in life there's winners and there's losers and you have to accept that and be a good winner and be a good loser and learn from it and learn if you win to be humble. And if you lose to be grateful because you learned a lesson. So I, I'm all for life's lessons. It's all about life's all about lessons and equality, equal pay for equal work. I don't think there should be any, uh, any difference. And, and we're definitely going toward that direction. It hasn't always been that way, but we are as a society. Um, I don't like the vitriol that we deal with in society when people just spew, you know, terrible garbage all over. And, and the other thing I think a lot of people are guilty of, and this has definitely been during COVID, I've seen this is, confirmation bias you know a type of group think where where you only look for the information that confirms your belief and and the, there you go again it's kind of like reading a horos, horoscope you know uh days later and applying it to, to that day you can find a way to say uh-huh and justify something and uh, there's there's a lot of us myself as well guilty of confirmation bias and just not even being aware of it. So, so I try to be more open to it. I know when I was in school, when I went to university, we would have these debates, late night debate, you name it, any topic. And at first I'd be offended because, you know, I was never challenged in this belief that I always grew up believing, but then I was challenged because there were people that did not agree at all, vehemently disagreed. And, and then, and then it was just an interesting exercise in growth. 
So um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm answering your question, but equality, diversity, inclusion, those are things that are important. I mean, that's why too, Jim, I got to say, and, and this was one of the things, and, and I, I thought, how do I, how do I approach this? You know, do I, I could have walked away and ignored and not done the show. And, and that would have been the easy, that would have been the most easy thing to do. But instead I decided, you know, I want to be part of making change. And so it meant I had to take a few bullets, a few harpoons, a few arrows. And, and, you know, people were discouraging me saying, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. And, and I got to tell you, I'm kind of a person, I don't like to be told what to do. I don't like a gun held to my head. I typically don't go along with that kind of a system. I, and I, but I thought, no, you know what? I, I know Jim's, Jim's not a bad person. And, and so he said some things. So what, we're going to throw him under the bus forever. I mean, aren't we taught to forgive? We're, we're all screw ups. Every one of us is imperfect. Every one of us. And to me, again, when you're throwing the stones, when you're jumping on, when you're ridiculing, shaming somebody, that does not encourage them to be better or to, to come your way. It's the other way, meeting them in the middle. So um, anyway, that's why I wanted to come on. And again, I, I respect the fact that you've tried to reach out to to Laura and that didn't work out and, and so be it. And I've never talked to her about this uh, at all, ever. And, um, uh, but, but still, you know, it, it's something, you know, you think about it. What point do I become vocal? What point do I try to do something? Ignoring yep. it doesn't make it go away. And I thought, you know, so we have a difficult dis discussion. And I like to just talk about other things, not this. This is very uncomfortable for me, uh, believe it or not, Jim. Um, but I thought I wanted to have the discussion. I want to put it like, let's talk about it. Let's not pretend there's an elephant in the room. Let's talk about it. But I, I, I like what you said in the paper when you said you've, you don't believe in the things you used to believe. That's great. You're growing too. Like we all are. Mm -hmm. I love that you said confirmation bias. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine today and, uh, he came to me about four weeks ago and said, Oh, I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. And then for four weeks, he's been beating himself up. And today he found out that he was completely wrong and he didn't need to torture himself for four weeks. So I really, I promised him I get better at calling him on his own, his own crap, because, you know, we have this dialogue in our head, you're a loser. And you know, this isn't right for you and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it's just the enemy working on us, but, uh, Talk to me a little bit about, and I want to keep you on time here. Um, how do you think you're being treated in the media? You're talking well, about confirmation bias. It definitely seems to be the media, and I'm talking mainly about the two media sources in the Niagara region here that are most prolific. They seem to really have their favorite targets and then their favorites as well. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, uh, I, I accept it for whatever it is, and regardless of, how I'm being treated. Uh, I'm not going to change who I am and what I stand for. And when the people are tired of me, they'll replace me. And I'm okay with it, with that, because that's just the way it is. It definitely frustrates me when you don't get good journalism. And we've seen some that's not good because a, a true journalist holds a mirror up to society. They don't judge. They're no. not subjective. They're objective. And they let you make your own opinion. Tell and I, I'm sorry. Tell the story. Let us decide. Yes. The let us. Just, and if you want to write an opinion column, then by all means, put a big thing at the very top of it, mm -hmm. opinion. But don't write your opinion into a story that people are trying to get their facts from. That's frustrating. And I read other papers. I read national papers every day. I read a lot of things. I try to get my sources from all sides. So I'm not falling in that trap of getting the same information from the same type of source. So my thinking is the same. I try to be objective uh, because I don't know all the answers and I, and I don't know that I ever will, but I try to get, so yeah. So when you're getting targeted um, like an umpire or a referee who has it in for you. Yeah. That's frustrating. Cause you feel like you never get a fair shake. You never get a fair chance. And that's why Jim, I wanted to come here. When I read that you said, I don't believe in the things I used to believe. And, and you told me how you tried to reach out to Laura Yip. And I thought, so what are we going to, we're going to ostracize you. And we're never going to talk to you again. And that's it. We never want to hear from you again. I think that's, that's not what we're about, nor is it what we should be about. And I think it, I look at my own, you know, being not really treated as fairly as I'd like to be by certain media. Uh, but again, they're human. I got to remember, just like the umpire, they make mistakes, human error, they're human. 
you know, and you like to think, I know when I was a kid, I think, you know, your teacher, you held your teacher up so high and they were almost not human. And the first time you saw your teacher in the bathroom, you know, taking a leak, you're like, oh my God. Or the human. <laughs> you're like, you're human. And then you realize, and, and then I remember I had this one uh, math teacher, she was amazing. And she would do Mrs. Knight and she would do the math right on the board and, uh, and make mistakes as she was doing it. She was so smart that I would go back to her for years later for help when I needed help because she just had a way and she was willing to be human. And I had such respect for her. As a matter of fact, I've, been, I've talked about her recently with other friends because she would make the mistakes in front of you. And I realized you're not perfect. I'm not expected to be perfect. Thank God, because I'll never be perfect. So that kind of stuff, I think, helps us realize that none of us are perfect and nor will we ever be and, houses, you know right brother uh, just on the way out i've been a huge uh critic of the niagara region to the point where i've been saying for i don't know 10 years now maybe close to it we don't need the region the region as a political body does i was going to ask you uh, you know as something fun to steal man decentralization the abolition of the political body the Niagara region, make it a service provider. Yeah. We need collection. We need negotiation of contracts. We need, you know, fire services in the NRA, you know, there's all kinds of services that need to be, you know, make it a service provider, a buyer group. Can you, and I think you kind of, I think you're more a one Niagara guy. Like let's do a part with the municipalities and just have a super region. I'm still a greeny, a lefty from the standpoint that I think decentralization is the tool. You let the people, the people closest to the problem make their own laws and fix their own problems. So I want, I want your thoughts on defund the region, cancel the region, get rid of the region as a political body, because I don't know, man. You think you, do you think Niagara Falls would be that much worse off if they didn't have the region telling them what to do? Hmm. Well, that's a loaded one. That's, for, I think, a whole other show. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just, at 5 o'clock, I put this one on you. I'm not stupid. <laughs> tell me the meaning of life in two yeah. minutes. So I would say in this case here, uh, yeah, eventually we are going to be one Niagara. We'll be the city of Niagara. There's no question in my mind, eventually. And I was of the mind that it would be a two-step process. Maybe we go to three or four cities and then to one city. Uh, it'll have to be top down because it'll never, it's never happened from bottom up. So no. Toronto was amalgamated by the province right. as was Hamilton, London, Ottawa, pick your area. Doug All, Ford backed off of that? He did. He did. He backed. I'm sure a lot of people are talking about it because here we've got more politicians per capita than anywhere else in the country. I think we've got something like 136 municipal politicians and a population of 450,000 people. And I'll tell you this. I have never in my 55 years ever heard someone say, you know, the solution to the problem, we need, we need more politicians. Yeah. I have never heard those words uttered from anyone. And boy, we have an awful lot. And I believe too many cooks uh, in the kitchen, kind of an issue we have. There are a lot of great politicians, but my gosh, less is more. And I'd love to see something more streamlined. Yes, we do some good things collaboratively, as you mentioned, things like garbage and Niagara Regional Police. And we do a lot of good things. Are, are there some overlap areas? Yes, there are. Are there some areas where the region's involved that they shouldn't be? Yes, there are. There's a lot of these areas, but we put our best foot forward. We made the argument for leave it the same, uh, a few cities and one city. In the end, after all the consulting, nothing was done. We, everything was just left the same. So I don't know if there'll be a stomach for it in the future, but uh, it was definitely a bit of a, a divisive conversation. But I think the idea of less politicians is not a bad idea. And the last thing I'll say to this is the municipal people were organic, whatever you want to call us, you know, the old uh, quote that, uh, you know, shit flows downhill, excuse, I know I, we want to keep this I, PG it's here. All but, an interview uh, with those swearing and you got to, now I got to put a, a th and uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, and I always say, and I politics is downstream from culture. Is that what you meant to say? <laughs> and I'm saying, I'm, we're at the bottom of the hill, of municipal works, and it's all flowing our way. But I love it. I wouldn't change it. It's gritty, it's organic, it's authentic, it's real, it's hands on. I love it. I love being with the people. I love being at the, at the business open. Like for me, that is the ultimate best thing. It's what I love, where I love to serve. I love to serve the people where the people are. Come to where the people are. So here I am. 
Mayor Jimmy D, I love you, brother. Thank you for standing tall. And thank you for being a man when I text you. What are you doing? You And, you know, I don't use the best language all the time. And you're always like, hey, what, whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean, you don't think any less of me because I call you out on your stuff. So anyways, uh, I really appreciate you standing up for, for the interview as well. And uh, just a final thought on the way out. I'll leave it to you. Well, I think this is good. I think we're uh, acknowledging the every one of us and uh, we got to look in the mirror. And I think uh, if, if you just try to do this, I'll give you what uh, advice. I, I talk about my mentors a lot. One of my mentors says, you want to know the best way to win an argument? And I said, yeah. And he said, say you're right. And he said, just try it. He goes, and he says, I do this to my brother. When he says something, I go, you know what? I think you're probably right. And he goes, finally, he goes, this was going on for quite some time. My brother wised up and he realized what I was doing. So then he would say, no, I think you're right. And he said, no, no, you really are right. But try it sometime. But we all want to be right. So why don't we try a 180? Because that's the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome. It doesn't work. So you got to be smarter than that and try something different. So instead of debating and arguing, try sometimes say, you know, maybe you're right. But it's amazing when you use those words, how you can disarm somebody and they don't feel that they have to fight for their position. You just give it to them. And then you have a whole different conversation. So I'm here to meet you in the middle, Jim. I really respect the fact that you're willing to meet me. And I know I gave you a chance to cancel me. So I told you I want to come on and I, I wanted to call a few things out, tell you a few things I didn't agree with. I didn't think were right. And you said, no, I want to have the conversation. And, and the fact that you're still growing and you acknowledge it, you're growing, I think is awesome. I'm looking forward to where we're all going to grow, where we're all going to go. And I think if everyone in society was willing to acknowledge that we're not perfect, we're better people in a better society. I think you're right, Mr. Mayor. And I will say on the, well, just to support your, your statement there, uh, I don't know if it's just a, you know, a metaphor for life, but, you know, the old story goes, you know, he said to the old guy, hey, you've been married 75 years. How, how did you ever get to that point? And he says, I, I, made up my time, I made up my mind a long time ago. I could be happy or I could be right. I chose to be happy. You don't have to be right all the time because when you're right, there's a loser. And the loser feels like a loser. And you might bask in your rightness, but what you've sacrificed with that so-called loser is not worth it. It never is. So I appreciate your time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing more of you on politics because uh, I haven't been paying that close attention, but I'm back. I'm watching again. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Jim. All right. Great. Thank you, Mayor Jim. Cut you loose here. And then